Okay, last one. Experiments. <laughs> You're like, what about all those monkeys and those rats in those labs, right? So that's going to be a different type of sampling and population completely. They're experiments. Experiments are usually expensive then they take time because if you're in a lab you're going to need a lot of help and you're going to need a lot of recording and um, analyzing assessment so, so experiments are its own kind of monster inside this um, kind of statistical world so there are two types of studies that we can do is the observational study which we've been doing throughout the course of these first few sections we've been discussing. We haven't really discussed experiments. So experiments are the other type of study that we could do with research and statistics. But that often means that we're doing a treatment, we're measuring, we have placebo, we have time, we have a lab, right? So experiment, there's a difference between experiment and observational study. Observational study means you're just observing what, what exists already. You haven't done anything. You, how much? How tall are you? You've done nothing. You just asked a question. They give you an answer. Um, an experiment says, "Here, let me give you some medicine, or let me give you some diet food, and then come back every two weeks and tell me how you're doing." Now you're doing something to your subject. You're not observing. You're you're now doing a treatment, and then you're recording some results. Okay. So let's go ahead and see the difference. In the weight of 30 randomly selected people are measured. So you're not doing anything to the subject. You're just asking whatever exists, their weight, and then a response back. So that would be observational. Subjects are asked to do 20 jumping jacks and then their heart rates are measured. So notice that right away they do not ask to, they're not observing what already exists, right? They're saying, come in, now go do something, I'm going to do something, go do 20 jumping jacks. Okay, and then come back and let me record something. That's going to be a treatment and that's an experiment. So these are, this is an experiment where the treatment is. 20 jumping jacks. Okay, so here, um, 20 coffee drinkers and 20 tea drinkers. So you have 40 people in which only drink coffee and only drink tea. They're given a concentration test. So tell me, are they walking in and saying, uh, let me observe, you, write down exactly what you, I didn't do, I'm not talking to you, get, tell me, I'm going to write it down. Or did the tea and coffee drinkers have to walk in and do something first, and then they're being recorded, right? So it looks like these coffee and tea drinkers had to do something first. They had to take a concentration test, and then they were being recorded some results. So careful here, it looks like they were just being observed as a coffee or tea drinker. They weren't. They asked certain subjects to come in, right? They did some sort of stratified sampling and they said, okay, don't tell me anything. Just, just take this test and then I'm going to talk to you and record stuff. That's an experiment and there's a treatment going on. And so let's go ahead for fun. Let's go ahead and write the treatment. The treatment is what? What were they being done to? Well, no, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> what were, what was the researchers doing and re to the t coffee and tea drinkers? They were giving them a test, right? So the treatment is that concentration test. And I'm a, I'm a pretty heavy coffee drinker, so I'm pretty sure my concentration is like perfect. <laughs> Okay, but some of you said, I mean, look at this last example and say, well, concentration has nothing to do with what you drink, but you know, some people concentrate better than others. They um, have this natural ability to have long-term attention to something, right? So there are a lot of other pieces and factors that we have to take in consideration. So we call this confounding and we always have to address it. We have to accept 
that our, res our search research isn't perfect and that we could have confounding. And that's when there are two potential variables that have the same causation or outcome. For example, co t coffee drinkers and tea drinkers, right? Maybe it's has, maybe concentration has nothing to do with tea and coffee, but genetics. So now there's two variables. There's what you drink and your genetics that may cause some sort of concentration, right? So then there's two variables. And so that's confounding. So we need to make sure that we accept that there are other factors around us that can influence certain outcomes and results. So I always use this example because this is what I see mostly with advertisements, right? A drug company claims people lost an average of eight pounds while using a weight loss pill. What could be some other variables that cause the weight loss? And is it confounding? Well, again, weight loss has to do with what mostly? Right. Definitely exercise and diet. Absolutely. And we have to admit a little bit of genetics, right? From my experience, people have different levels of metabolism. Okay, so the pill may help, but what are some other things that could cause weight loss? Is there more than one thing? If I don't take a weight loss pill, could something else cause weight loss? Yeah, you could be eating differently and you could be exercising or you could just be, you don't even need a weight loss pill, right? So if there's more than one variable than this weight loss pill that can cause weight loss, then these are confounding. Right, so it's confounding because there are more factors that can cause weight loss. So we just need to make sure that we're when we're doing the studies and the sampling that we kind of in the back of our head know that there may be something else causing it. Okay, so now let's talk about experiments. So in order to do an experiment, we need to be able to have a comparison. We just can't say, oh, the weight loss pill works. Well, we need people part of the study that doesn't take the weight loss pill. We So that way we can compare with the people who took the weight loss and see if it's actually the pill that caused the weight loss, right? So we do have a control group and a treatment group. The treatment group is the one that receives the treatment. The control group is the one that there's no change to its status quo. And they're usually given a placebo. And the placebo could be anything that's according to the scenario. We tend to think placebo as a pill, but it's not the case, especially when they're doing food experiments, um, cream, pharmaceutical, shampoo, makeup, you know, we're not taking pills for those. Um, and then um, we like the placebo to go to the control group. That way we know, okay, you, whatever you're doing in your life is causing the weight loss. Over here, they're taking, they're actually taking the weight loss pill. And so we can see the difference between you know, lifestyle and the weight loss pill. So let's see, let's see if we can actually determine a placebo for the, it's not always a pill, right? So like a study for a new medicine that is dispensed in pill form. Well, right away, we can always do a sugar pill, right? Which is called sugar pill, which is a placebo pill that you've heard before, I'm sure. So sometimes it's in form of a pill, but what if I wanted to do a study on the effect of alcohol and memory, right? So that one is like, okay, well, I wouldn't give a pill, right? I would probably give what? What would I give a placebo with alcohol? So you definitely need sober, non-alcohol people there and people drinking alcohol. So maybe we can discuss, we don't want them to know, right? So maybe we give the same type of beer bottle with the with a blank label, but this one is what non-alcoholic drinks. Could be the placebo. And the other one could be the alcohol, right? And so, but they'll be in, they will like put them in disguise, like black bottles and they won't ever know, right? So, 
How about a study of a frozen meal diet plan? I mean, how many frozen meals that say they're perfect for diet, you know? So we that wouldn't even be a pill form, right? We would have to disguise it as food. So we would have to, what, see maybe that there's an... I think, like, lean cuisine's pretty good because we could disguise that as, like, there's a little plate of pasta, frozen pasta. We could get another frozen pasta that's not diet food and, you know, have that as the placebo. So we could do non-diet frozen food. Non-diet identical frozen food. Identical. Because we don't want it to be the same, then they would know. So, okay, okay, so let's review a little. So we do have two groups, right? We have the control group that usually gets the placebo and the treatment group that gets the treatment. Whether that treatment is a medicine or alcohol or a diet meal plan, we somehow need to always have a treatment group and something to compare it to. And this is why we have the control group. So we can actually compare it to, to a group that just has a lifestyle, right? But we don't want them to know. We don't want treatment group to know they're the treatment group because then the, you know, we have that placebo effect, right? We have that effect of, oh, it's changing. I'm changing. It's so much better, you know, and really it didn't do any difference. So we want that to, we call that being blind, right? So we single blind means the subjects in the group don't know which group they're in. They just think they're all drinking alcohol, that they're all taking a pill, and that they're all eating all diet food, right? So they all think that they don't know who's who, what's what, right? The double blind study says, well, you know what? And the researchers who are doing self-interest studies, like the beef loves beef and beef is so good for you, that ha the researchers of the beef company would be do double blind, right? They would have the control their treatment that don't know who's who, and then the the researchers would also know who's in what group. So I don't know. Uh, let's say I'm a researcher at a beef company. I don't know who's eating beef and non-beef, right? And beyond beef, I should say, right? And the two groups, the treatment and control, they don't know if they're eating beef or beyond beef, right? So um, that is the best way because then you're not going to have any sort of, you're eliminating that bias, right? And that self-interest. So let's do an example with blind and double blind. Let's talk about a lie detector. Two groups of subjects are given a new test, right? One group is asked to answer the questions as they usually would truthfully. And the other group, we tell them, you better lie, because we want to see this lie detector test works, right? So, but the person administering the lie detector test doesn't know. So they don't know who's going to lie and who isn't, but they just, they need to test their new lie detector. So um, does this experiment have a control group? Is it blind, double blind, or neither, right? So the experiment does have a control group, right? So the control group would be the people that isn't receiving treatment, that is status quo, don't change anything. So what would people do during a lie detector test? They would just tell the truth, right? So the control group is the truth group. The second question is, is it blind, double blind, or neither? So again, blind is like just means one or the other doesn't know. Either the researcher doesn't know who's in which group or the treatment and control group don't know who's in whose group. Double blind means they don't know who's in which group. I don't know who's in which group. We don't want to know who's in group and group, right? And so it looks like here the groups actually know what they're doing, right? The truth group knows they're supposed to tell the truth. The lie group is supposed to know that they're supposed to lie. It's only the um, administer, the person administering the lie detector test doesn't know. So only one of the sides, they are blind. So it would just be a blind study. So it would be a blind study only because um, the person administering doesn't know. who is in the truth or lie group.
And um, essentially, we always like it to be double blind. And some some students always say, well, how can you do that? How can nobody know who's in who, what's what? Um, and this is where we use our assistants. We need a lab. We need assistants. And we don't use names. There may be numbers. And to, you know, group A, patient two. And that's all you know. 